oh, um, to get to get our next our next supply. Uh, so Got good it. afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Lisa Camahort Page. I'm one of the founding advisors of Remotely, a uh, professional development network and think tank that is designed to make remote work uh, for everyone. And we are having a series of fireside chats and webinars that are all about how to make remote work for you. And uh, if you want to learn more about Remotely, go to remotely.global slash join to learn about membership. And if you want to learn more about our future events, including one I'm hosting on Tuesday about taking in real live events virtual, um, go to remotely.global slash events. But to get down to it today, I'm so excited because I'm joined by someone that I've known for many years, uh, Lori Rudeman, who is uh, currently, her in current incarnation is Punk Rock HR, and she is the author of a new, a new book coming out in just a few weeks called Let's Fix Work. No, called Betting on You. Call it what you want. Just go to Amazon and buy it. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. That was your podcast you Your screwed. previous podcast name. I'm ah, I'm sorry, I screwed that up. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking about you and let you tell the accurate story. But before we dig into what you're doing right now, yeah, I met you at a blog. Her, you were a blogger, and you were already sort of out of your corporate HR incarnation and into becoming more of a thought leader on the future of HR. But mm -hmm. I would like to know a little bit about how Lori Rudeman. The Lori Rudum and I know wanted to go into HR to begin with and um, how you made that break and became a little bit, I would call you a, a maverick on an early adopter of new thinking that I think some things people adopt easily today, but some things you're still ahead of the curve. So so what was that journey like mm. to, to want to go into HR in the first place and then to make that break from traditional HR? Sure. There are two kinds of people I don't like to listen to, people who brag about their careers and then people who say, well, I've written about my career in my new book and I'm <laughs> going to be both of those people right now. So just please forgive me for that. But okay. um, all right. So back in the day, I was just this dumb punk rock kid in the 90s and had piercings and tattoos and dumb haircuts and had no fashion sense, right? Because I had no money. And I think part of this anti-establishment attitude that I had came from my hippie parents. And as I was going through college, I realized I don't have any money for graduate school. And back in the day, I had about $50,000 in student loans, which is about $100,000 in today's money. And I thought, oh my God, I need to pay this stuff off or I'm never gonna be able to do anything with my life. So I poked around my university and asked, what do you got for me? And they said, well, there's an internship and it pays at a candy company here in town, and it's in a department called HR. Do you want it? I'm like, well, if it pays money, I'll take it. You know, that's the kind of working class family I had in my background. So I entered into this HR department and quickly realized two things. Number one, I was kind of good at this work. And number two, I hated it. So it was real tense emotionally for me wow. from the very beginning. I mean, you know, the archetype of the HR lady, mean, stern, compliance driven, more, <laughs> more concerned about the time you put in at work than you as a human being. And I found that to be both true and untrue, depending on who I worked with. But because I was good at it, understanding people's motivation, understanding human psychology, tapping into my background of literature and religion, I like people's stories. Mm. So from there, I just took on this career for over a decade in the world of HR. And it led me to my final, final HR job at a global drug company that's in the news right now, Pfizer. And Pfizer was terrific. I learned a lot, but it also broke me. And when I finally realized I was broken, couldn't blame anybody else, I started to take accountability. And that's when this transition to writer, speaker, entrepreneur began. So thank you for letting me tell that. It's so interesting because this morning on my morning walk, I listened to a podcast. This is, uh, you just aligned perfectly. It was Shelly Archambault, who is on the board of Nordstrom, on the board of Verizon, a very, very uh, prominent woman in business. She was on Guy Kawasaki's podcast. And she said two things your story just reminded me of. She said, people tell 
uh, kids in college, you know, follow your dream, follow your passion. And she's like, you don't have enough life experience at 19 to necessarily know. And she goes, just go start something and then figure out yeah. if you're good at it. And, you know, she, she said, we tend to be like things we're good at. So, so go figure that out. And if it's not the right decision, go figure something else out, but like go out there and get more experience so that you can figure out what your passion is and your dream is. And you just, you were sort of the poster child for like, get a job, figure it out, and then figure out how to, like you said, work internally to turn that into something that's going to be meaningful for you. Um, So in this, in this transition, you were one of the early HR practitioners who was using blogging, using social media. Um, was How did that play into this decision to change your whole approach to your career? Yeah. Um, because I think sometimes, you know, HR was a little, I think, con- liked to constrain employees yeah. around blogging and social media. Well, you know, I wasn't just early in the HR scene. I was really early to blogging. I had my first blog in 2004, right? I mean, that's early compared to most people. I mean, yes. I'm not like, you know, Silicon Valley early, but I'm early for a woman in the Midwest. My, right? my first blog was 2003. So like you're yeah. early. There you go. I mean, there wasn't a lot of competition. And I started blogging because an ex-boyfriend of mine also started blogging on Blogspot. And I thought, if that chump can do it, I can do it too. (laughs) And I had been on the internet looking for career answers and they were all terrible. Nobody was speaking to me in a Gen X language that really made sense to me. It was a lot of boomer sensibilities, like, you know, pay your dues. And, you know, if you can't follow your passion, don't worry about it. Just make sure you pay those bills. And I thought there's got to be another path here. And so I started writing anonymously while working at Pfizer about what I saw, what I felt, what my experiences were. And from there, as I started to, I don't know, develop a muscle for writing on the internet, my audience grew and I got a little savvy around SEO. And when I finally realized that I needed to work on my well-being and take care of myself, and I did that work, I realized that the work at Pfizer was untenable, but I had this built-in side hustle that I had been practicing for many, many years. And it was easier to pivot to that and work on that as a business, as a consulting business, as a speaking business, as a writing business, because I had been moonlighting while getting a paycheck which is what I tell people all the time. If there's something you're interested in doing, keep your full-time job, get that paycheck, get that benefits and just work on it on the side. I don't know. It's it's not that it just works for me. It works for every other entrepreneur out there. Nobody worth their salt really just up and quits their job. I mean, that's like the myth of the alpha male out there of the entrepreneur who just burns the boats if you burn the boats, something's a little wrong with you. So for me, that kind of side hustle pivot was the right path. Right. When I think back to the early days of blog her, um, all three of us, Lisa Stone and Jordi Desjardins and I were all consulting in different areas. And for the first almost a year, we all kept doing that while we were doing blog her. Yeah. And then we made an agreement at the beginning of 2006 that we were going to phase that out, phase it out in order to focus full time, but we had clients. So, you know, we phased it out over time and this was as we were building revenue um, and putting ourselves in a position to be able to, to pay ourselves Mm -hmm. because, you know, we didn't take a paycheck for the first two years of blog her. So I had to have some money coming in elsewhere, you know, and not, not very many people can afford to just do that with no other source of income. It's it's not a very realistic view. (laughs) But that's the myth of entrepreneurship, right? You just have this big idea, you assemble a team, you burn the boats, and then money comes. And that's not the way the American dream is borne out. The American dream is borne out inch by inch, step by step, and sometimes five steps backwards, you know? But I really felt that it was a blessing to have that money from Pfizer coming in and also the real life experience of that job. Because when you do one thing, you get weird. The beauty of having a full-time job and then a developed private life is that you can take what you learn in your private life and bring it to work. And you can take the lessons from work and bring it to the things that you're doing in your private life, whether it's caregiving or being a member of your community or participating in a church or a temple. You learn so much from the world of work and vice versa. Doing one thing always makes people strange. Again, Look at all these entrepreneurs that are in the news. I mean, they're singularly focused 
and they're totally weird. <laughs> I say this a lot about activism, actually, that that the, the advocacy and activism that you want to do um, will benefit from the things you learn from being in business and that most jobs, most companies would be lucky to have the passion and articulate expression of of uh, your beliefs and the dedication that you bring to the issues that you care about um, applied at work. So I, I, I say that a, a very similar thing. Okay. So I want, before we dive just straight into your book, I want to explore one other um, thing that you have talked about and written about, about HR, sort of just establishing the sort of breadth of your thinking around yeah. the topic in general before diving into how to fix me. Um, <laughs> uh, you wrote an op-ed earlier this year that I actually reached out the minute I read it and had you on my podcast to talk about because I thought it was fascinating. And it was about defund HR. Mm -hmm. Now, this is related to the principles of defund the police, and but the way you explained the relation and your personal experience that had you bringing those two things together, I thought that was fascinating and really great food for thought. So would you mind explaining that a little bit to sure. um, our audience? I'm happy to do that. So for some background, I'm the daughter of a Chicago police officer. It happens to be my mom which is an interesting take on that story. So for years, I saw my mom really drive into work and become this compliance-driven person who wasn't necessarily responsible for changing the system, but had to enforce rules that maybe she didn't even believe in. So these are the 70s, 80s, 90s when she worked in this job. And when I think about human resources, the job in and of itself has no power. It's really an arm of people who have power. And the way it was constructed is fundamentally broken because we tell people that HR is there for them to solve policy issues, to be their advocates, or maybe not even be their advocates, but to investigate issues. But at the end of the day, they are there to protect the organization from lawsuits. That is the function of HR. So when I hear people say that HR can be a solution for changing you know, racial justice at work, or when HR can solve me too, it's a fundamental lie. There is no way that HR is in a position of power to do anything. The building that they're, the infrastructure that they're built on is fundamentally broken. You just don't keep throwing money at this building. What you do is you tear it down and you rebuild it or you don't rebuild it. You maybe reallocate that money somewhere else. And so I really think that when we say HR is part of the solution, that's wrong. People are part of the solution. I would love to defund HR and use those dollars to teach individuals how to be their own HR. That's my passion in this world, teaching people corporate policy, understanding how it applies to them, creating transparent systems and teaching people how to manage themselves and others so that they don't have to go looking to an outside system that's biased anyway. So mm -hmm. defunding HR is something I'm really passionate about. And I think in doing that, you can take all these HR people who are fundamentally good people. I mean, they're not looking to be racist or sexist or homophobic, and you can empower them to do other, different, better, more important work. That's my thought on that. What do you think about that, Elisa? So the, the reason I liked it so much, so there's what I think about it, I like it so much, is there's such this debate about the defund term, including around the police and around HR. Yeah. And, and I didn't know what defund the police meant either when I first heard it. So I Googled it and in five minutes, uh, I figured out it meant exactly what you just said, which is take those funds and use it to build better systems, to reallocate those funds to other things. And I do think that I think often that we silo problems in companies into HR. And yeah. as you say, they're not empowered to change the systems that created those problems. And similarly, police are, you know, they're enacting things and they're now asked to deal with every mental health issue and every, like there's so many different issues they are asked to deal with. Uh, and that's where I do have some empathy for them because that's not A, what they were really, I mean, now they have to have training for that, but is that really where our dollars are best spent? And, um, and with HR, I often think we silo things and we say, okay, well, HR is going to be in charge of this problem. Well, once you put it in HR, no offense, but people who are not in HR think it's not important. That's right. Right. That's right. Um, it's not, they, you know, HR just has 
for the reasons you pointed out, Mm -hmm. this reputation of being an arm of the company at its heart and not really empowered to change systems. And so you put it there and that's exactly how seriously people will put it, uh, take it. And so I thought your way of explaining this idea of of distributing um, both distributing the responsibility and accountability throughout and then maybe up-leveling who, who really has the power. I thought that made so much sense. And I liked it as a metaphor for the same issue with the police. Thank so I I'm, I'm, I have said to people a million times, HR doesn't work for you. No. HR works for the CEO, like That's for, right. the, for the company. And but so- you can understand why I could no longer continue to work in human resources, because I would come in and say things like, you know, it's not my responsibility to make sure some dude doesn't sexually harass someone. That's not my job. That's that guy's job. It should be <laughs> and responsible for his own behaviors. And who needs training on this? I mean, who fundamentally needs training on human decency and human behavior? That is a lie that we've created through lawyers and systems and all sorts of things. Nobody needs to be trained to know that sexual assault and sexual harassment are wrong. And yet we've got this whole system that's been built funded by millions of dollars to tell people how to behave at work. I just well, could no longer be a part of that. Drove me crazy. I had to speak out against it, which is what drove me out to the internet in the first place. And then eventually out to blogging and then writing and speaking and writing this book. Well, and because sexual assault and harassment and racial insensitivity and homophobic insensitivity and all of those things are on the spectrum of what could be addressed by simply having a no asshole rule, right? Because because a lot of problems, I'm in Silicon Valley and I I can tell you a lot of problems are about the belief in the brilliant asshole myth. Yes. That companies cannot survive without their brilliant assholes. He's an asshole, but he's brilliant. He's an, he's an asshole, but he sells like crazy. He's an asshole, but this happens or she, you know, Um, and because we allow for this level of assholeness, when it gets up to this level, you, you know, we're not really enabled to do that much about it because we've let a whole lot of it go. Um, I'm so glad you're talking about this. In my book, I talked to Professor Bob Sutton, who wrote the No Asshole Rule. He's a longtime mentor of mine. I love that man. And one of the things he taught me very early on in my career is that if you walk into a company with that asshole, look around because it's more likely that you're going to turn into one of those enablers. You're going to be complicit rather than you're going to change anybody's behavior. So you may not be able to quit today, maybe not tomorrow, but you need to get the hell out of a company that employs an asshole. Now, where do you go? Because there are a lot of jerks that are in positions of leadership. Yeah. It's a really good question. It's a different question. But if you're in an organization and you feel stuck You absolutely recognize that. It's a toxic work environment. There's a jerk at the top, but it's on you to get out of there. They're never going to change. It's just statistically improbable. Although idealistically, we want to say it's not fair. I should be able to make a difference. That CEO should go. Nobody's going. You know how you change the landscape? Don't work for companies like that. So I love this advice you give people, which is that you say, yes, quit. Okay, maybe you can't do it today, but then plan for it tomorrow. So the right. whole the betting on yourself um, and the whole kind of thesis you have about start within. Yes. And, you know, when you talk about d- distributing HR out to people, so yeah. they, you know, so how do we, how do we start? How do we start on fixing ourselves? How do we start on focusing within? And, um, you know, what's a good starting point for that? Because we're not used to, taking that ownership uh, to the point, and I have done this where I asked to be put on a list to be let go because I was in a really super toxic thing. Yeah, but yeah. Everyone I know, and this was during the dot-com bust, everyone I know thought I was crazy. I was making good money. I liked my actual job, what I did, and I liked the actual team of people I hired. Yeah. But everything above me was a toxic and um And everyone I know thought I was insane. Well, this is what makes you super successful and really interesting because you put yourself first, you bet on yourself. And I think that question is good. Where do we start? Because, you know, I'm no Tony Robbins, thank God. You know, I'm not going to sell you on a bill of goods and a six step program. (laughs) And I'm not going to give you a case study that you need to read to figure this out either. I wrote this book to just ask some fundamental questions. And these questions are based on the premise that I think 
fixing work is an inside out job. If you work on your own individual well being, your passion for yourself, your self advocacy, your finances, your passion for learning something new, and your ability to take risks. And I know these are all concepts, I'll drill down in a second. But if you work on these things individually, you're going to do the work inside that will carry over to your professional life. You fix the personal, you fix the professional. That's what I believe. So where do you start, right? Because you can start anywhere. There are a million places. I think you start with what you feel is fundamentally broken within you. For me, that was my well-being. And I realized nobody ever takes over the world with five hours of sleep. My well-being, my eating, sleeping, movement cycle was so broken because all I did was work. And yet I saw all different kinds of people around me make time to go to the gym or work on their wellness or just enjoy their lives and have a family. So I tested the system. What if I really did put myself first? What if I did go to bed? What are they going to fire me? I dared myself to be a slacker. And instead of working those 60 or 70 hours a week, I just work 32. You know what? My career got better. It's a weird corollary. The less you work, but the better you work, the better your career. I have seen it not only in my life, but in the lives of high performers that I talk about in my book. So well, I think there's work. a kind of mythology about this sleep thing, you know, and Ariana Huffington, um, she sure. kind of had this come, come to Jesus moment where she talks sure. about sleep, but there's a mythology about not needing sleep. Martha Stewart certainly talks about this. Mm -hmm. Some of these guys who run companies out here in Silicon Valley, Tony Shea, I mean, in the very sad stories following his untimely passing, there were talk, there were stories about him trying to see how little sleep he could get by on. Um, oh, weird. And so it's a weird dichotomy. Right. And these are extreme examples, but there are men and women out there who are caregivers, caring for older parents, caring for children, or just saddled and swamped with work who are burning the candle at both ends. Yeah. And they may be working 80 hours, but their work is crap. And that's a tough discussion to have. So don't wait for your HR lady to come knocking on your virtual door these days and tell you your performance sucks when you're like, oh my God, I'm working so much. Peel back pull back and see what you can do on seven hours of sleep, right? Nobody's asking you to go from four hours of sleep to eight hours or figure out what your best optimal place is. But the thing is, most people don't know themselves. They don't know when they perform well. They just show up. They're victims of the Outlook calendar. They're victims of the old stories they tell themselves. And then they get caught in the cycle of learned helplessness. So for me, I started with well-being. Some people could start with their finances. A lot of people are stuck at work because they have to work. Yes. What would you do? You know, I think about Pfizer, my former employer. They just reallocated their budget, reconfigured everything, spent hundreds of millions of dollars to get a vaccine to market in six months. It tells me so much. It tells me money fixes problems. So Maybe money's not the currency in your life that you're concerned about. Maybe it's time, maybe it's well-being, maybe it's nutrition, maybe it's energy. But what could you do if you singularly focused on one task and kicked butt at it? You could take over the world. If Pfizer, with all of its corporate chaos and its weird culture, which is everything, really, right, right, right. If they could do something like this in six months, imagine what you could be in six months in your life. I mean, I, I know it's possible. I coach it daily and I lived it. So I have a couple of, of responses to that. So do, that time when I walked away from that company at the bottom yeah. of the bus without another job, the reason I felt like I could do that um, was that I had two years worth of uh, take home pay in the bank. Now, the reason I had that is because I was very, I conserved, I was very conserved. The one place I was conservative with was, was how I spent my money because I, you know, it was during the dot-com boom. I was going up and up and up the ladder, making more and more money, but I wasn't spending like that. I spent like I was still a product manager. Okay. And so I, it, they, you know, they kind of call it fuck you money. And, yeah, and for sure. It basically was that. And I saw so many people who were married to their mortgage that they had gotten because pe they were offering big old mortgages, maybe bigger than they should have, right? Uh -huh. So people had, familiar. Yeah. you know, they had a responsibility. So I definitely, money was something that 
I always say money doesn't buy happiness once you get past a certain Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you have shelter, you have food, you have Uh this, that, and the other. But after that, uh, a a couple making $75,000 a year is not markedly less happy than a couple making $300,000 a year, right? Right. So so (laughs) money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys freedom. Yes. Uh, It gives you more options. That's right. But the other thing is I, I did this at Blog Her because we... The people who, a lot of our company was remote, Mm -hmm. Uh, about half our company was always remote. And then we had about a quarter of our company in New York and a quarter of it in Silicon Valley. And because Silicon Valley is so far flung, our office was always equally inconvenient for everybody in the mid peninsula. So everybody was probably traveling about 20, 30 miles to get there. Um, And the commute, I just hate sitting in traffic. I hate it. Never, never gotten to, I I know people who are like, well, that's when I listen to podcasts or, you know, whatever. I hate it Um, because, you know, driving a car is dangerous. I could listen to podcasts at home and be safer. Yes. So at some point I realized that no matter when I left the office, it was going to take, the later I left, it was going to take me more and more time because traffic built up until, you know, up until 8 p.m. So there was no, so I already was leaving my house at 9 a.m. So the carpool lanes were open so that I would have the shortest ride there. And then I was realizing I would have to leave at 8 p.m. to miss, to get the same ride back. And I thought, on the other hand, I know when I get home, I'm going to be checking in. If there's work to do, I'm still going to be doing it. So why don't I leave at 3.30 p.m.? You know, okay. it doesn't matter as far as how much I'm going to work. It doesn't right. matter about how much time or effort. So why waste three hours in traffic when I could waste an hour and a half? And that oh, was what? about the calculation. Yeah. And so it, at different times in your life, it can be different things that drive you to say, you know what? I, I could be improving my overall quality of life, which to your point would improve my effectiveness. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people are stuck in this position of, I could never do that. Like I could never ask my boss for this. I could never ask my boss for that. One of the lessons of COVID is you could pretty much ask your boss for anything right now. They need you. They need your talent. They need your passion. They need your ideas. They want you to work a million hours. So while they want you to work a million hours, you could ask for anything right now and get it. The other thing I do in my book though, is if you're stuck in a toxic environment, I teach you how to ask for severance. So to your point, Elisa, like, boy, a lot of people would love to know, how do I ask for severance? Well, I teach it in chapter eight. That's like one of the things I'm most proud of in this book because executives bake in their severance at the very beginning of their tenure. Why you don't do that is beyond me. I would never take another job again in my life without having a golden parachute. And I'm not anybody special. I'm just Lori Rudiman. You are like me. You're a worker who adds value to an organization. You should learn how to ask for severance. So chapter eight, it's worth the price of admission just for that, I think. Wow, that is that is great because that's something about my uh, dot-com bus story that also amazes people is I wanted to walk away, but I did it with a with a, with a package. I got a package and, you know, it wasn't necessarily that everybody was all excited to give me a package. Like, you know, it was one of those great experiences where the CEO accidentally plugged his laptop into um, a projector in the boardroom for a meeting and an email about me was on screen where she's like, why doesn't she just quit if she wants to leave? Like, why should we do that? And um, so that was, that was one of those classic moments. But anyway, um, yeah, I think that that is such an interesting, and it's hard. I think money obviously is always hard, but I think it's also to your point, I think people don't think of themselves as having that kind of position or agency. So what would you, um, how does your book address if you're in an environment that's fairly traditional, you feel like it's a fairly traditional approach, how do you start to move them towards some of these more creative ideas? Well, you're never going to move anybody unless you believe it yourself. So that's first and foremost. You're never going to convince anybody to see you as a leader, to treat you with respect and dignity, unless you treat yourself that way, unless you view yourself that way. So I spent some time in the book really talking about that, talking about how to test things. If you're Uh telling yourself a story, is it true? How can we also de-risk things so that if you want to tell yourself a new story, it's not so chaotic and crazy. We can minimize the 
the chances of failure. I teach something called the pre-mortem, which is an old stoic exercise. So if you're interested in doing something new, the book will teach you how to really make sure you give yourself an advantage of success by more than 30%. So it's like a lovely little exercise in the book. But once you start to see it, the funny thing is other people will see it too. Other people around you, your peer group will become advocates for you. You'll recognize it in other people and start to advocate those who demonstrate self-leadership, confidence. It just kind of becomes part of the culture. But again, there's no playbook. There's no drug I can give somebody. I'm not Pfizer. I can't change anybody's you know, chemistry here. But what I can do is to challenge people to think a little bit differently and to try new things things. And again, you may have this idea of yourself, this picture of yourself, and you go to your leadership team and you ask for a raise or a promotion, which I talk about in the book, how to do that. You may uh, advocate for someone who hasn't had a lot of attention, or you may bring up a serious problem and it may backfire on you. That's life. That's adulthood. That's another thing we need to talk about. And then you deal with the consequences of that. But if you're living a life of integrity where you know who you are and what you believe in, you're focused on your well-being, your values, it's not going to rock your world uh, compared to if you're suffering from imposter syndrome, you're sleep deprived, you're not fueling your body with anything. So it's really, when I say fixing work starts with you, it doesn't start with a career coach. It doesn't even start with my book. It starts with really understanding who you are and what you're all about. I want to ask your thoughts on a theory I have long held. Um, Can't wait. About, about um, everything you get is for what you're going to do in the future. So I, I talk to people about this when they're looking for funding. Uh, so I, you would be surprised how many people, um, startup founders, position the need for funding as being because they're so busy and they need help nobody cares. You're doing it right now without the help. Keep doing it. It's cheaper. Like yeah, that's not yeah. what anyone's yeah. going to give you funding for. Yeah. Right. And I also think when people position wanting a promotion or a raise, they're doing it based on what they've done. And I'm like, well, you already did that for me at the title and salary you have now. Uh, I think I get it, but I think most companies don't think of things like promotions and raises as a reward for the past, but mm. as a nudge to, to what are you going to do for me now that you get this, what are you going to use it to do this new power, these new responsibilities or this new, you know, this new reward. Um, do you, do you think that's generally true? Well, I do think that nobody gets promoted unless there's an organizational need for it. So I have all of these people who've come to me throughout the years saying, I'm a manager. I've been a manager for five years. How do I I really feel like I'm focused and doing the work of a director. And it's like, yeah, I bet you do, but your company doesn't need you to do the work of a director. And frankly, to your point, Elisa, they're doing it now at the role of a manager. So unless there's an organizational need for a new skill set, or unless you can make the case that you need to be a director at this company, it's never going to happen. So that's first and foremost. But I love this idea that what you have now is for the future. Like the experiences that you're getting, all of this, this is what you're building now for some future life. This has really played out in my own life. Like, I often wondered, why did I hate this work at Pfizer? Like, why am I going through this? And why am I blogging? Like, what's all this about? And little did I know that back in 2004, I was investing for my life in 2020. Mm -hmm. I was doing the work at, you know, 30 that would pay off when I was 45 years old. I had no idea. So it tells me that today is not tomorrow. And the future is so hard to predict. But the one thing that you could be doing is working on the foundational things of your life to make sure that your future has a fighting chance. And that's why in my book, I focus so much, and not on nutrition and weight loss and all the stupid things around well being, but about feeling good and performing at your best, not just for today, but for tomorrow. I don't know. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think I do definitely think that everything you're doing now, you know, people say, oh, I can't complain about this or that bad thing I experienced because it made me who I am today. And I'm like, I would have liked to have found out who I was without the bad things. Like, I, bet I, <laughs> For sure. I bet I still would be pretty awesome, you know, yep, like, yep, yep. Mm-hmm. but but intentional yeah. because I don't I don't I don't necessarily buy into that for the stuff that happens to me. Um, but for the stuff I choose to do, yeah. 
I feel like that is all of what's going into the future me and that the more we can choose, the more we can know that we're making choices, we're going to be intentional, we're going to do these things. Um, And I think that even when you're being, I've spent a lot of my career being sort of someone who sees what flows past me in the opportunity river and like jumps on things and tries them. And then sometimes they work out and then sometimes I, they work out, but I don't really like them. Mm -hmm. I always say it's much more likely you won't like something than that you won't be able to do it. Um, And sometimes they don't work out at all. But, but so in that way, I would, I would say that I'm very kind of reactive or responsive, but in my head, I'm intentional about, and I, I articulate it as I'm going to follow yes until the no becomes obvious to me. Okay, and that. that's my philosophy. Yeah. So it may seem like I'm being sort of like, let me try this. Let me try that. Well, I'm going to do this for a while. I'm going to do that. But it's my philosophy that mm-hmm. I'm going to just take all these things in and then choose the ones that I want to be um, the things that are building for my future. Yeah. yeah. And awesome. I don't think everybody might be comfortable. I, do you know the game Katamari Damachi? I don't. The, it's a little rolling thing. You roll it around and it picks up objects and then it grows and grows and grows and grows. So some people might not be comfortable with a sort of Katamari Damachi like career or life or whatever, but it's my intention. So for me, to Mm -hmm. your point about looking inside and you get to make the decision for me, that's how I've done things. I may still decide, you know what, for this next step in my life, I need to stop doing that. And I need to figure out, I need a little bit more singular focus and I need to that all could be coming, but again, that would be on me to decide. That's so, right. That's right. So with your book, like what is the what is the format of your book? You've mentioned some exercises, you've mentioned some really great informational, no one's gonna tell you this, so let me tell you yeah. um chapters. But is, is it a workbook? Is it like how would you break it down? What percentage is yeah. a workbook? What percentage is information? I I love that question. You know, I think the best books I've ever read are from authors, both fiction and nonfiction, who wrote the book to themselves. It's Mm -hmm. like the story they've been telling in their hearts for years. And so this is a book that I wrote to my, not intentionally, and it's certainly not written like a diary, but to a younger version of myself, the book I needed when I was 30 or 35 or even 40 years old, really trying to figure out, okay, if I were at a crossroads with my career, what would I need to hear? And so the book is story-driven, it's narrative-driven, and it's broken around different aspects, highlights the HR and employment life cycle, but it's not an HR book. It's really a career book for anybody who feels lost and is looking for some honest answers. So there are a couple exercises in there, but my publisher was pretty specific. This is not a business book. You're not giving anybody bullet points. You know, there's no two by two quadrant. We're not doing that. That's not going to sell. What I want you to do is tell your stories about work. And so each chapter is very clear. You can see where you are in the employment life cycle to know if that chapter makes sense for you. Uh, You know, everybody has dealt with growing stale at work. And so I have a chapter on learning at work. And it's not like you should be on LinkedIn learning or you should be on Coursera. It's about what are you interested in doing and how do you carve out time to learn a little something new and how learning can actually save a terrible job. So I tell I tell stories, my own, other people's. But what I'm really trying to do is to get people to pause, reflect and think, oh my God, I was so embarrassed about this or, oh, I was dealing with this. Now I know it's not that big of a deal. It's universal. And I'm, I've learned something. I was entertained and you know what? She's not wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that's what I want to hear. <laughs> so. That's so funny. I think that about things like imposter syndrome, I feel like it's becoming, it's becoming another problem. It's becoming gendered. First of all, I think people talk about it so much more about women when everyone I know has had it. Oh yeah. And it's becoming therefore one more thing women should fix about themselves. And I think the, the only fix is to know that everybody literally experiences it at some point. And if you don't, you're probably like a sociopath. Uh, I'm using that term loosely, but um, I, uh, I love that you brought up imposter syndrome because I think about like companies, you know, Pfizer didn't say, oh, I've got issues with my parents. Let's let Novartis have this quarter. No, they just went, OK, our culture is kind of janky sometimes and executives are weird. Let's go get this vaccine to market. Right. So you can have imposter syndrome yeah. or not and still do really great things in this world. So Absolutely. I want everybody to know that. 
however you feel is not necessarily what you do for a living and it's not reflected in your work. So have imposter syndrome, don't have imposter syndrome, but no, you can still do amazing work feeling however you feel. So a, a sort of, um, as we're coming to the close here, and if people have questions either on Facebook or YouTube, um, you know, please go ahead and submit them uh, and we'll, we'll try to answer them. But one of the things I'm wondering is how do you think remote work makes makes all of this easier more difficult is more necessary like how does remote work play into and and not just remote work but the fact that suddenly so many more people were thrown into remote work how does that change the game and now what do you think is hopeful about that like what do you think maybe we're learning out of this it's so funny because I've been working remotely since 2007, 2008, yeah. and it was actually better when nobody else was working remotely. <laughs> like when it was just me, I'm like, oh, my neighborhood is quiet during the day uh. and, you know, people are at work. And so I know where to find them, but I could disappear and do whatever I wanted. So now that we're all in the professional sense, working remotely, it has definitely leveled the playing field. And whereas I didn't have to be as compassionate and empathetic towards the workforce before, but I demanded it for whatever reason myself. Now I'm like, oh snap, we can't do that meeting because that's nap time for your baby. I guess I'm going to, I'm going to be okay with it, you know, or like whatever the issue is, right. I have to pull it within me. And that's a different kind of way of operating for elite snobby people like me. So that's the personal selfish part of it. But leaders are in the same boat. They yes. never had to demonstrate compassion and empathy. And I'm actually a little optimistic because I do see CEOs and C-suite leaders having a heart. And that gives me a little bit of hope. You know, would they prefer everybody was part of a fiefdom and some really expensive office again? You bet. Will they try to push us back to work sooner rather than later? Probably. But the interesting thing is that talent has a little bit more power now. Yeah. Companies have seen that we can actually be more productive with a little bit of flexibility. So how do you then tell people to go back to the office? It's not going to happen. So I think it's going to be an interesting conversation in 2021 and 2022, but we've learned a lot. And what we've learned is that flexibility is good for organizations. I don't know. What do you think, Elisa? I think my theory is that the first six to eight months, companies figured out logistically that this could be done. And to your point that it could be fine for productivity and fine for achieving goals. And, um, but they didn't spend any time, no surprise, because they're companies, they didn't spend any time thinking about how it should be done culturally. And so the immediate knee jerk reaction at the six to eight month mark was, yeah, yeah, you know, it's fine, but you'll never innovate the same. You'll never have the same teamwork. You'll never, never, never. And I'm like, no, what, you know what guys, you need to spend the next six to eight months figuring out how it's done culturally. Yeah. Like, yeah that's well said. First of all, you're kind of deluding yourself if you think your team's we're that happy together, like, <laughs> like those wonderful you, hot desk environments that were terrible yeah. and cacophonous, you know, flight yeah. hangers that we used to work in. Yeah. I mean, I think they're That's fooling like, themselves about what culture yeah. was like before, sure. but the thing is if we could figure it out logistically, I also believe we could figure it out culturally and that that's the next step. Yeah. Um, and that that should, and, and probably will happen. Not a hundred percent, everybody remote all the time, everywhere, but there is going to have to be an adjustment because most workers, um, it's not the average worker who's saying, yeah, I can't wait to get back. It's, it's the CEO who doesn't real doesn't know what to do if he doesn't have everybody at the immediate beck and call. Yeah. But I, I agree with you that it levels the playing field because there's nothing worse. And I've experienced this being, you know, um, I've been the sole executive who's sitting in my home office when everybody else is together and I've seen how they, you know, how you get left out of yeah. everything from decision making in the hallway to the, the video camera pointing so that the person who's speaking has always got their back to you. I mean, this is a literally something I had to ask about multiple times. Could you at least face the camera? That's right. So I, I right. like see you. Yes. Um, so, so now everybody's experiencing what those, the slice of people who were remote we're experiencing. And so I think they have a great, like you said, more understanding, more empathy. Um, but I think that culturally it, it needs as much work and as much thought and as much investment. And this is where I think companies are going to bulk as much investment 
in, in making great culture as you invested in helping people have better internet or helping people, you know, have uh, better logistics, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to need to although, invest the same. Although we haven't quite invested the way we say we have in terms of ergonomics or infrastructure for people to work Absolutely. from home. I know people who are still using an ironing board to hold their laptop oh. for meetings so they can stand up, right? An ironing board and books. I mean, this is ridiculous. And so I have, I have books stacking well, up my laptop. <laughs> I have I have books as well, but I'm not funded by a large company. You know, I'm yes. funded by Lori Rudiman. I yes. think you know, if I were a large technology company, I would want my workforce to have stand up desks so they don't have back pain down yeah. the road. It's a short term or long term disability issue. These are the things we need to start thinking about. And I think workers were fine jumping in at the very beginning and going, you know what? All hands on deck. You want me to work from my pantry? I'll do it. But yeah. that's quickly coming to an end. So companies really need to think about investment physically and culturally as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So you had a couple of great op offers and opportunities for people watching. Um, and Chris, uh, Chris Heuer, who runs remotely, put them in the chat here for Zoom. But for the Facebook and YouTube folks, do you want to tell people about the two I do. great I things do. that you have? Yes. And we'll make sure that anybody who's participated today gets a link to these offers as well. The first one is that I'm a LinkedIn learning instructor, and I wasn't sure what that meant for a long time. It meant that I did some courses, right? I talk about self-leadership in one and conflict management in the other, and they're fine, but there's a ton of really great stuff out there. And I have a link for anybody to use and anybody to share. For It's for free for 30 days. You can get on LinkedIn learning. If you don't buy anything, but you watch a lot of courses in 30 days, that's perfect and let it expire. I'm happy we're in an economic contraction and I just want people to have free stuff. And so we will make sure that everybody on YouTube, wherever you are, you're up in Mars, I don't know how you're seeing this through you know, the, the ether, you get that link. And the second thing is I recognize that not everybody can buy a book right now. I mean, that is very physically challenging for a lot of people. It's 25.99, a lot of people can't afford it. Goodreads is giving away 50 copies of my book. It ends on December 14th. So I would love for you to join in the giveaway and see if you can win a copy. So we'll have a link to the Goodreads giveaway, but you can also find it by going to Goodreads and typing in betting on you. There you go. That's what I want to give away. So it's fun to give you. people things. I appreciate that. We do have a question from, I assume, Facebook. Have you seen any great examples of leaders who have improved their culture to meet the remote work challenge? Who's, who's doing great? Anybody? Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, I've spent some time recently with my client DocuSign. And so know that's with a grain of salt. But DocuSign is really making an intentional effort from everything from onboarding through day-to-day -day conversations through their formal talent development program where they're trying to train people to learn and grow to really help people. And I sound like a commercial, but they want people to do the work of their lives. And they recognize that having this weird time right now with no formal thoughtful process around working from home was not going to allow people to work great. And so they've really formalized the way they communicate, the way they operate, the way they talk to one another. And I'm quite impressed by the outcome. And that just doesn't come from me working with the executives. I work with rank and file employees at DocuSign as well. So that's one example that I think may be relevant, but I suspect that in small to medium-sized businesses, companies are getting it done because they're assuming good intent and they're mm. leaning into compassion and empathy. So it's one thing to talk about an enterprise software company, but it's another thing to talk about like your local design firm or your local marketing agency. I think they're in fact, I know, like my girlfriend, Mary Ellen Slater, was running a remote first marketing agency called RepCap before COVID. And since that time, morale has only grown stronger. So it's being done. It's being done by just being radically effing human. That's it. A follow-up question on DocuSign. What did they do to formalize new ways of working with each other differently? Absolutely. So I can only talk about this a little bit. I mean, I am under NDA with their uh, HR practices, but one of the really great things that they've done, let's just take new hires. Normally they would bring these new hires in and do this physical experience to make them just fall in love with their jobs and then have a training program that was all in, you know, together in real life. They really had to put some thought 
into how to do this virtually. Cause you could shove anybody into a zoom room, but are they going to pay attention? Are they going to enjoy it? Are they going to learn anything? It's going to feel sticky. So they've actually made it so that every new hire has FaceTime with the CEO. Oh, wow. That's not like nothing. company are they now? Uh, I don't, I don't remember actually. That's a good question, but they're not nothing. They're not no, a small no. teeny tiny company. No, so, so really making sure that people feel seen and loved and heard, not because they've been with the company a long time and they've earned their keep, but because they're new and we're excited to have them on board is such an important lesson. And I hope it continues after COVID. Oh, Chris just looked up. They have almost 4,000 employees. So that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot. That's a big company. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I always close, and especially because I muffed it at the beginning, where can people find you, read you, listen to you, hire you? Um, tell us about the Lori Rudiman universe. Yeah, the Lori Rudiman show. Again, there's nothing like someone talking about herself to make you just want to throw up. But now I'm I've to asked. Do. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so I have a podcast called Punk Rock HR. And you can go to punkrockhr.com to listen to it and then to kind of fall into the Lori Rudiman ecosystem, as you said. And on that website, you will find my book, Betting on You. Um, but it's available anywhere books are sold. And I also did something fun in my career. I did the narration for the audiobook. Oh, it's that is fun. A new skill and super stressful, especially with landscapers and everything that come into the neighborhood. But we Oh, because you had to do it in your home. I did. I recorded from home with an audio engineer patched in from New York City, and we took it slow, and I had my wonderful podcast mic and my headphones. I felt kind of famous, and it was just <laughs> a fun career highlight. Um, everybody should be able to do like one thing out of their comfort zone like once a year, and that was my thing this year, recording that audiobook. So thank you for asking. Um, punkrockhr.com is the best place to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Lori, for joining us here. I just have so much fun talking to you. Uh, I, uh, I'm really glad that you were able to join us. And I really think you have a, it's just a great way of flipping the coin a little bit on um, how to think about your next move, um, which I should apply to myself um, <laughs> too. Uh, We're doing it right it remotely. I mean, I'm really a big fan of everything that's going on there. It's been a real joy to see the development of this platform and I can't wait for 2021. Good things are in store. I'm sure of it. Oh, thank you so much for yeah. saying so. So again, this is Remotely, a weekly fireside chat. If you're interested in learning more, remotely.global is the site. You can learn about membership at remotely.global slash join and future events at remotely.global slash events. Or you can follow us anywhere on the socials, Remotely Global. I am Elisa Camelhart page Thank you to Lori Rudiman from Punk Rock HR and author of Betting on You uh, for joining us today. Have a great day and a great weekend, everybody. And wear your mask, stay physically distant. Hope is on the way. We got to get it out a while longer. And that is us signing off.